to the Wrestling Maniac Podcast, episode number three, your source of wrestling reviews and news for the second week of May. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the podcast. This week, Raw, SmackDown, and 205 Live were pre-taped in London as the WWE finished its tour of Europe. On Raw, which was a decent show, uh, as I will note here in the po- uh, as I will note in the podcast, that the crowd noise was extremely edited throughout the show. Uh, we had a interesting twist to the show where Raw General Manager Kurt Angle was not in attendance, so uh, the show's general managership duties fell to Dean Ambrose and to The Miz. So it was a good twist to the beginning of the show that that could offer many that could offer many high points and then the Miz and the Dean Ambrose could go back and forth building their matchup at Extreme Rules the next Raw pay-per-view. So we open the show in London Michael Cole, Corey Graves and Hall of Famer Booker T and Dean Ambrose announces that Kurt Angle will not be there tonight. Uh, the fans boo some. Uh, of course, I didn't really hear a whole lot of boos. It was mostly muffled. And Ambrose said that Angle had named him the acting general manager for Monday Night Raw. Uh, of course, The Miz is going to come out and he is going to say that he had talked to Stephanie McMahon and that they did not want the show to be solely left in Ambrose's hands because that that he could not be trusted and uh, that the show would completely fall apart if Ambrose was left in charge. So the Miz was named co-GM for the night. While they were talking... Strowman come out. Braun Strowman come out. His arm was in a sling. Uh, the crowd could be faintly heard. Thank you, Strowman. But he did not care who was in charge. He was just going to say that he wanted to face Brock Lesnar, the Universal Champion, uh, at Great Balls of Fire, and that he had destroyed Roman Reigns, and that he deserved to be the number one contender for the Universal Championship. While he was talking, Kalisto came out, challenged Braun, saying that he was not afraid of Braun, that he actually beat Braun, and Braun had sidelined him uh, after their dumpster match. Uh, be, uh, Braun went on a tirade. And it was uh, some pretty decent booking on that part. Uh, so we're going to have tonight a one-armed Braun Strowman versus Kalisto. And then Ambrose turned to The Miz and informed The Miz that he had a match tonight also. And that it was starting next against Finn Balor. The Miz and Ambrose was a decent match. Of course, The Miz plays the little chicken heel very well. And it Maurice got involved, Miz's uh, wife. And The Miz, uh, which ended up in costing, uh, causing Balor to, um, which ended up, causing Bauer to to get to touch the referee. The Miz automatically used this and Bauer uh, was disqualified by the Miz who he was fighting 
as the co-GM he was fighting to, then he named himself the winner and still number one contender contender for the match. Ambrose then come out and restarted the match, banned Maurice from ringside, and the, the bell ring starts and Balor attacks the Miz from behind with a uh, sling blade, and Balor drops the Miz again, goes to the top and hits the coup d'etat, and gets the win over the Miz. Next, we, after the match, we have, uh, we see Alexa Bliss in the back, and this was a very interesting segment where Alexa Bliss was in the back and Nia Jax walks up and she thanks her for complimenting her on her promo last week and that if uh, she and that she wanted a shot at the title and that when Bliss was done with Bla Bailey that if she would give her a title shot that she would ensure that she would uh, be her best new best friend and so we're going to have this dynamic where we're going to have Bliss, Alexa Bliss uh, of course she's going to be manipulating Nia Jax and trying to keep her new best friend around as much as possible. Back from the commercial we have Alexa Bliss versus Mickey James. Mickey James uh, I would say Mickey James dominated most of this matchup. Uh, Mickey James uh, was coming back with another uh, she was coming with another comeback and then she goes to the apron and Nia grabs her leg for a distraction uh, and then we see Bliss take advantage of this and pins Mickey James for the win. Mickey James uh, then was assaulted by Bliss. She mounts her. Bailey comes down for the save, chases off Bliss to the back, and then uh, after that was done, then Nia completely takes out uh, Mickey James, who's still in the ring. So we have that segment and that dynamic there with the women on Monday Night Raw. I will say this. It looks that the women on Raw really hold my interest more than the women on SmackDown. And we'll get to SmackDown here in a little while. Uh, Alexa Bliss is in the role that she needs to be as a heel, opposed to Charlotte not being a heel on SmackDown, which I think is a mistake. Um, Alexa Bliss, since this is the direction that they're going to go, they have to build that dynamic again with Bailey, since they lost a little bit of uh, the the sympathy factor for Bailey. Uh, I look for Nia Jax to uh, really sort of be her insurance policy, Lexa Bliss's insurance policy, which is a good thing, and we'll see how it all goes. I look for for Bailey to win the title back, that or they're going to instead of Bailey, they're going to get into something with. Alexa Bliss and Sasha Banks because that's where I believe the greatest allure is as we would say or that's where that the most ma that's the best matchup that people want to say to see we have um, a lot of uh, dynamics there that's playing in the women's uh, I really don't like Mickey James just being an enhancement talent or a mechanic for the women's division. I think it would be 
better if she was more in the mix. Uh, you could have some good matchups there between Mickey James and Alexa, which they do have a little bit pretty good chemistry in the ring. And also, I think you could have some good matchups between Mickey James and and Sasha Banks. As far as the beginning of this show, I believe that it was, like I said, an interesting dynamic. They had to do something here uh, for this show. Uh, the show really seemed a bit off to me as I watched with the crowd noise being extremely edited through the show. Uh, I had no someone that was that went to the London show and they said that it was really fun, said it was crazy and what you would expect from a London crowd. Some of the Brit the British crowds, I believe, add a lot of entertainment into the, sh the show and uh, we'll get to that at the end of the program. As far as The Miz and Finn Balor, really believe that Finn Balor is above this rivalry, above a rivalry with The Miz as is it is shown here on on the programming. Uh, he's just not he's just a little he's real not in the same level uh, as uh, I believe he's a level above the Miz he should be in the main event picture and maybe we'll get that uh, rivalry between Finn Balor and uh, Bray Wyatt we really didn't have anything of that they really didn't build this any from last week. You would think that there would be some repercussions from last week with um, Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt. Maybe instead of Braun Strowman coming out, which was a good thing that he did, and Kalisto, that it would have been better if Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt would have come out. They could have built a little bit more into a, a feud going on there. It was, I mean, their feud between Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt, which seems to be the way that there was going to go over the last few weeks, that that was a little dead this week and wasn't really uh, explored. There was no story progression with uh, Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt this week, which was a little bit of a, a letdown. Next, we move into uh, the matchup between Braun Strowman and Kalisto. We were uh, left with uh, a little bit of backstage uh, arguing with The Miz and uh, Dean Ambrose. And then we're left with a segment between Samoa Joe and uh, Rollins fighting backstage. Uh, I think they could have saved this, and we'll get into this just a little bit later. They could have done something just a little bit different here. And my ideas, if I was writing and producing this um, but first let's get to Braun Strowman and Kalisto remember that Braun Strowman has his arm in a sling he is legitimately hurt and he is going to have to have surgery so this was actually a good way to write Braun Strowman off of TV for an extended period his match with Kalisto uh, it was decent. I mean, of course, Braun Strowman, even one arm, is going to dominate Kalisto. But all of a sudden, Roman Reigns comes out. Roman Reigns has his shoulder, has his ribs taped up. Uh, the crowd boos Roman Reigns. Um, 
before this, in the opening segment, uh, we did hear a little bit that it wasn't cut out. Thank you, uh, Strowman, for taking out Reigns. And now we have, we have again that this Reigns is still getting booed by the fans. And Braun charges in and and tries to do his thing with uh, with uh, Reigns here, but he's met with several Superman punches. This was a, a good way to to write Strowman off TV again. He finally takes finally hits him out. He hits him uh, on knocks him outside the ring. They go back and forth. Braun um, hits the ring post. Uh, Reigns begins to unload on his arm with the sling off. Knocks the sling off. And we, I did not hear these, but reports and looking at several different reviews that, that there was chance of Roman sucks. I heard nothing when I watched this. So... And the range grabs a steel chair, then he smacks Braun in the arm again. Um, it was a good way to establish Reigns dominant. I, I think that Reigns, even though he was bandaged up, he could have uh, sold a little more like he was in pain instead of just a guy that had uh, uh, injury tape on him. He could have sold a little bit here more. On injuries to him, it should have could have showed. Uh, though he was supposed to be dominant in Superman, uh, Roman Reigns, he could have showed a little bit. I think he could have. I think he could have sold more here. Uh, then Strowman, he he ran away, and now we're we're going to see. We're not going to see Strowman on TV from four to eight weeks. I'm sure that we'll be having updates. But um, it's a good way to to write Strowman off. Again, Reigns needs to sell more here. He's injured. His ribs are injured, and he, kayfabe, had internal injuries. Now we all know that the picture last week with um, Strowman and uh, Reigns come out where they were together at uh, some of the sites in Italy together breaking kayfabe. I feel that uh, since they did break kayfabe that it that this feud has lost just a little luster and it doesn't feel that tension is a little gone and that's why it's important I think for especially the top guys in the main storylines and main programs here in the WWE or in wrestling or any wrestling is to protect kayfabe uh, don't have pictures don't put yourself in situations that where you can where you can be in a situation where you're going to compromise the storylines that's going to go forward. People argue that they're just actors that they need their own private moments. I agree that people need their private moments. That it's good for a group of for for a for co-workers to do things together outside of the workplace but this is more than acting this is an ongoing soap opera type thing I mean type uh, story that we lose a little bit of the dynamic uh, chemistry that was between Strowman and Reigns. We find out that they really don't hate each other. And we find that they don't, um, that they're not, that, that it isn't as real as people want to believe that it is. And I know that 
we know that we can separate reality from fiction but still wrestling holds that different place to where people have to respect the kayfabe of what's left of it between the different characters because number one you owe it to your your number one you owe it to yourself and your character development number two you owe it to the people that have given you that spot to be the lead story of of the the company and we don't know where this is going to go we don't know exactly the storylines that will develop as Strowman is injured Reigns will do something there's been rumors and I'll probably discuss this a little bit more rumors are going on that Roman Reigns may get an intercontinental title run, which I believe is a good idea. Um, Dean Ambrose is dismal as an intercontinental champion. Not many any knock on uh, Dean Ambrose, but Dean Ambrose is one of those guys that don't need a title to get over. He's already over with the crowd as a babyface. An Intercontinental Championship run would help Roman Reigns, especially if he got into a program with The Miz, if they kept The Miz where he looked strong as a heel, not just completely crushed. The Miz is ready and he had needs to be rewarded to be into that top spot as a heel on Monday Night Raw, I do believe. Um, one of the top heels on Monday Night Raw because he is one of the best heels, if not the best heel, in the WWE. And to have a program with The Miz, to have a program with Bray Wyatt, to, and me personally, I would either turn Ambrose or Finn Balor heel uh, to work with um, Roman Reigns. And people say, oh, you're a Roman Reigns fanboy. No, I'm not a Roman Reigns fanboy. I point out where he needs to sell. There was a complete lack of selling here in this entire segment with Braun Strowman that he was injured. He didn't sell that. I mean, they get caught up in the adrenaline rush of, of that, but they for, and they forget to do that, but you know, you got to make me believe, make me believe what storyline is is going on is real. That's all I ask. Uh, next, they reveal, the announcers reveal that there will be a match on Monday Night Raw between Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins. Next, we have the Tag Team Turmoil match, which features Enzo and Cass versus Cesaro and Sheamus, Heath Slater and Rhino, Goldust and R-Truth, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson to determine the number one contenders for the Tag Team Championship versus the Hardys. Uh, we got a little tease here of, of uh, Goldust and R-Truth that they needed to come together for one last run for one last shot to, to challenge for the Tag Team Championship. It was good. It was a little tease. and we, I thought that maybe we would have got to see something a little different. But the first matches that we start off was with was Enzo, and was, uh, Enzo and Cass versus Sheamus and Cesaro. Cesaro and Sheamus went over Enzo and Cass, of course. Um... They're playing out this, um, throughout this uh, match, they're playing, or series of matches, they're playing out the, um, the storyline of, of Sheamus and Cesaro being unstoppable. And they did a good job with this. Um, next, we have Heath Slater and Rhino come out. 
uh, uh, challenge Seamus and Cesaro. Uh, Seamus and Cesaro um, again go over Rhino and Heath Slater. Next we have Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. Um, and Seamus and Cesaro go over Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. Seamus catches Luke Gallows with a bro kick and they roll him up for the pin. Again, we're looking at the Gallows and Anderson look weak. I don't like this. Um, uh, I don't like this at all. They should have uh, won with something else besides a clean pin over Luke Gallows and Anderson to make an, their other heel tag team look strong. Then we have Goldust and R Truth come out. It was a good match back and forth, but in the end, uh, R Truth misses a splash in the corner, and Cesaro rolls him up for the win. After the match, Cesaro and Sheamus uh, began to um, beat down Goldust and R Truth. You know, this, this is an idea here that I would have liked to have seen. Why, instead of having Cesaro and Sheamus win here, that to have R-Truth and to have uh, Goldust go over here, it would have given us something different. It would have given us something more to look forward to. It, you know, it, don't, it canceled out the a little bit of the story that was told before. Hey, you know, here's Goldust, here's R-Truth. Especially Gold Dust, our truth. They've been around forever, and you know, it would have been good to see them again in that spot. You know, if even if they would have got a pin on uh, uh, Cesaro and Sheamus, even a fluke pin would have worked here. Then have Sheamus and Cesaro come in and beat down Golden Truth. And then have the Hardys come out and save Golden Truth. And still they can have that match, even if it's an interference with Sheamus and Cesaro. Show me some heel uh, tendencies. That That's what I'm seeing, is they want to have Sheamus and Cesaro be this monster heel tag team for the time being. I heard that they're supposed to split ways around SummerSlam. But have them have some dynamic, you know, where they show that they're heels. Again, you know, if you're a heel, you do heel, you do heelish things. 50-50 booking does not work. If your character is going to be a heel, let them be a heel and let them get heel heat. If they're going to be a face, let them be a face and be the baby face that everyone can believe in so the crowd can pop. Here with Seamus and Cesaro, it seems they're doing 50-50 booking to protect both characters in the future if they want to make them heel or make them face. Let us have real heels in the WWE on those that you want to be heels in the storyline. Do not just simply pick one or two characters. I don't understand why they don't have some creativity uh, with this. Moving on in the show, we have Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins. Before we had them have a backstage altercation, which led to the match here. This match pretty much was recycled material. Everything was recycled. Instead of doing this, why couldn't they have a backstage brawl? Uh, would have made something different. It would have, it would have, com it would have completed the same thing, uh, and then it ended. Then it ended. Then ending it up inside of of the ring, uh, it would have added a little bit more dynamic. You know, said well, then then Samoa Joe wouldn't have got the disqualification and Seth Rollins wouldn't have won. No, that's true, but they could have done something different. 
Again, we get the same old recycled match. Seth Rollins wins by disqualification, and then Joe continues to beat him. Like I said, a recycled match. It didn't didn't do anything for me at all. Even Samoa Joe just seemed like you know. I know they was trying to get trying to build back uh, him as a heel from being pinned by Rollins at the pay per view, but too little, too late. They could have done something where it was a backstage brawl, something innovative. I mean, Dean Ambrose is you know the GM for this night. And they could have done something of that nature. Next, we move on to TJ Perkins and Jack Gallagher. You know, I don't understand. We have these other guys. We have these top-level guys. And then we have TJ Perkins and Jack Gallagher. Uh, TJ Perkins ends up winning this match. Of course, uh, it was it was uh, not very long. Neville was on uh, commentary for this match, but TJP wins this match by pulling the tights. And then after the match, Jack Gallagher uh, leg bar by TJP, which I thought was a good little, you know, thing to do. Uh, but here, you know, here's a little, just that little hint of heel tendencies of TJP to pull the tights. Though TJP's music does not make me think he is any that he is a heel he's still got the the mega man type music i mean give me something that's give me something that uh is a little bit more heelish there we have sasha banks versus alicia fox next uh this was just a filler match didn't last very long sasha banks she wins of course uh but you know at least alicia fox she she looked good in the match. Sasha Banks nailed her with a double knees backstabber uh, for the win. After the match, it showed that Alicia's uh, Fox's shoulders were up, so we got maybe a little bit of storyline there. Yeah, I mean, come on, WWE, let's build a little bit of the, of these uh, women up, these people up that's not being used at all. Let's give them a storyline. Alicia Fox is at least decent in the ring give them a little bit of storyline to where seem have a place on the program and i'm glad to see this alicia fox was frustrated of course and you know she's always had that that crazy girl type uh personality going on in the wwe which is good and i would like to see it explored a little bit more Give her a little bit more airtime and build her character a little bit more than just being a valet. Then we have our main event, Bray Wyatt versus Dean Ambrose. Uh, is back and forth. The Miz come out for commentary. Uh, this match really didn't do much, I don't think, for Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt looked good in this match. Uh, he ended up hitting uh, Sister Abigail on Dean Ambrose after uh, the Miz's interference. And... Then we have uh, then we have the Miz at the end of the program, stating holding the Intercontinental Championship belt, simply saying that he is awesome, and that that uh, that holds the the title and says that next week that you know next week he will be the Intercontinental Championship. He will be the Intercontinental Champion, which. They're moving this match up from Extreme Rules. They might be moving this match up from Extreme Rules to have, uh, you know, to have Roman Reigns go after the title, which I have no problem with at all. Next, we have SmackDown Live. Uh, this show was a lot better. It seemed that uh, this that SmackDown that the crowd was a little bit less edited. You know, if the crowd starts chanting F you and all this stuff like that I don't you know you can see where the the WWE doesn't want a crowd to hijack the show like that because they're not on Showtime or HBO they are on USA NBC so they have to keep it just a little bit TV PG but I can understand a little bit of the editing but it is completely it was completely dead during Monday Night Raw, when um, Kalisto comes out, you usually hear the crowd laying lucha, uh, chanting lucha, 
it um, maybe they did I couldn't you know from what I, while I was watching it seemed that it was completely edited out but moving on to Smackdown we open with Randy Orton stating that he didn't lose the House of Horrors match because of Bray Wyatt or because of refrigerator was dropped on top of him that he lost because of uh, Jinder Mahal's interference uh, then Jinder Mahal come out uh, with the Singh brothers and Jinder Mahal talks about how he stole the title and that that come uh, backlash that it will be the age of the Maharaja and then he begins to speak in Punjabi then uh, when he does this Kevin Owens music come out Kevin Owens music hits Kevin Owens comes out and got a pretty good crowd pop even though he got booed a little bit when he started uh, getting into the uh, how he ended Chris Jericho's career uh, Owens said that his goal now is that he won't just be the US champion or the face of America but that but once he uh, but once he's done with uh, AJ Styles that that he wants the WWE title because he has set he has set his sights on being the face of the WWE uh, it was good it was good um, good Kevin Owens is great on the mic don't think there's anybody in the WWE as good as Kevin Owens other than probably the Miz Kevin Owens and the Miz probably the two top heels in the WWE at the moment AJ Styles comes out interrupts him reminds everybody that he is the Smackdown is the house that he built and this all sets up then Baron Corbin comes out and Baron Corbin comes out begins to speak but before Baron Corbin comes out to speak uh, he is hit he is um, interrupted by Sami Zayn who comes out and just starts attacking him and then it sets up to where it sets up the main event of the evening holler holler we got a tag team match six man tag team match Owens, Ginger and Corbin versus uh, and the Singh brothers who will be out on the outside against uh, Orton, AJ and Sami Zayn which is our main event for Smackdown Live next uh, we have Natalia versus Becky Lynch the welcoming committee comes out with Natalia uh, which again this is a horrible name for a group the welcoming committee I mean come on it's Natalia it should be the heart foundation um, come out and James Ellsworth takes the mic why is James Ellsworth still on my TV he's so irrelevant um, they're not doing anything with him and he is so out of place here as Carmella's baggage Carmella takes over the mic and introduces Natalia and she comes out uh, Smackdown Women's Champion Naomi comes out next and tells uh, London to make some noise and Naomi introduces Becky Lynch then Charlotte Flair comes out and she uh, says uh, I don't need anybody to introduce me <laughs> which was great Charlotte is so much better as a heel than a face then we get the the match between Becky and uh, Natalia it was an okay match it just seems that the women on um, Smackdown are left a little bit in limbo here Natalia got the win over Becky because Becky was distracted and then they ensued then Charlotte Naomi began to argue in the back and Becky got between them and tell them that they needed to be on the same page it does seem that the women on Smackdown are a little bit in limbo do not like the name of this faction the welcoming committee Natalia deserves better Maybe they're going to use this Natalia versus Naomi to get the title off of Naomi and then for the title to switch back again because they've got to get the title on Charlotte and Charlotte's um, going to be a face. She can't really face Naomi. She could, but it 
they like to keep things faces versus faces, heels versus heels. But I really don't think it matters at this point in, in this segment. Next, we get a segment with uh, Brizongo, the Fashion Files, uh, who are the number one contenders for the Tag Team Championships. They're dressed as uh, a UK cop, and uh, uh, Tyler Breeze is dressed as a UK cop, and uh, Fandango is dressed as Sherlock Holmes. It was hilarious. It was a great segment. Uh, we get uh, Luke Harper versus Eric Rowan. Why, I do not know. I don't know why these guys are fighting. There's no storyline there. Uh, Luke uh, Luke Harper takes the pin here, and Eric Rowan goes over, which is surprising. It wasn't a very long match. Uh, he has Rowan has a new finisher, a spinning power bomb. It looks okay. Uh, I still think that it could be a little. They need to do something else here with Luke Harper. I would like to see actually Luke Harper and Eric Rowan be a tag team. Don't know if they want to turn Harper back heel or not, but he's not doing anything right now, and he's too talented. He's just lost in the shuffle. Uh, my thoughts is this, is that both on Raw and SmackDown, there needs to be a lower mid-card belt. They could do so much with that TV title, a network type, a championship. They could do so much with that and give uh, people a reason to tune in to these to these guys so they could develop so that they could get some footing and be built up a little bit um, and then we have Ziggler's segment where he's in the ring and we find you know he's telling really running down Shinsei Nakamura he does this until Shinsei Nakamura's music hits again amazing music but it's edited. It's edited. The crowd's edited, so it's not as effective as it normally is. Ziggler tells Nakamura says that he's tired of waiting. Let's get it on, you know. And um, Ziggler says no. That it's, that he's going to choose uh, the time that they're going to do this. And it was okay to build up. What their you know their match again? What are they fighting for? I guess you know uh, this will be a good first match up uh, for Nakamura as he comes to SmackDown Live. Um, but Ziggler deserves more. He needs to have like a lower mid card title. He would be perfect for that role, and it would give him some importance, uh, like a TV title or something of that nature, and uh, it would give him something to fight for even if Ziggler would retain the title. Um, it's a good build. I don't like the artist's name that's on Nakamura, the artist Shinsuke Nakamura, but it is what it is. It's what the WWE is going to do with him. I do feel that they're going to keep Shinsuke special, uh, and that's all that matters is they keep him as a special attraction. Next, we have Sami Zayn backstage with Randy Orton and AJ Styles. Um, he's talking. They're making Sami just seem really like an annoying person to be around. And I don't like this at all. Sami Zayn is very talented. And uh, I'll have some more comments on the treatment of WWE of him. Um, Jamie L had some comments on a WWE program which I couldn't believe that he actually said. He said that Sammy, he would rather be captured by ISIS than to have to sit through a dinner uh, with uh, Sami Zayn, and that's a little bit uncalled for. Um, there was actually chants during dark matches on SmackDown Live for that was uh, calling for to fire JBL, but they're not going to fire JBL. Uh, Getting more to uh, the the event, back to the event here, we had the match again with the Ascension and Brizongo with what happened in the back of them finding the Ascension in a, in a closet room, just smacking each other in the chest, and it was weird. But we had uh, the Ascension and uh, versus Brizongo. Brizongo picks up the win, then the Usos come out and do a, cut a promo, which was just 
strange. Uh, that they I guess they're gonna go with they're going with the hip hop they're going with the hip hop uh, gimmick, which I guess that it's okay. I really want Brizongo to win the titles here. They're entertaining. They just not that anybody deserves anything, but they do sort of need to be built up and and get the win here. We see um, a little promo uh, from Rusev that that says that he has not been given any sort of uh, he has not been contacted by Shane McMahon or by Daniel Bryan, so he is coming to SmackDown live next week, which I think that's going to be good. I'm glad he's back, and we're going to get to see him. Next, we get to the main event of the evening. We have Randy Orton, AJ Styles, and Sami Zayn versus Jinder Mahal, Baron Corbin, and Kevin Owens. AJ Styles and Baron Corbin and Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn to a degree, really bore the workload of this match. This match hid though Jinder Mahal did have a few spots during the match it hit a lot of uh, Jinder Mahal's lack of entering ability which I don't believe Jinder Mahal has it's way too soon for Jinder Mahal to be pushed to this level um, very, it had a lot of uh, different aspects of it I think this match as I said on Twitter this match showed one clear thing and that is that Baron Corbin should be the one that's being pushed right now instead of Jinder Mahal. Jinder Mahal, the only reason why he is being pushed right now is because the WWE wants to have a presence in India and they need a face to go into India and the Maharaja Jinder Mahal even though in talking with some wrestling fans in India they really view, you know, Jinder Mahal as a villain. They don't view him in, you know, any sort of adoration and not, you know, I don't think he's that popular. But it's good that he's getting a push, uh, that someone is somebody different. Um, the WWE is doing good as far as making him out to be a good heel. He's got, he's got the... Seeing brothers there, which I think they that it's good little faction. Um, at the end of the match, we uh, we have Orton uh, come with a we have Orton uh, trying an RKO on Owens. He misses. Jinder comes from behind, being the legal man, and hits the Cobra clutch uh, slam and pins Orton. Uh, well, we don't know exactly which way the direction that uh, the that the WWE is going to go here. Um, I remember Jim Ross said on his um, blog that he feels that the build for Jenna Mahal has been solid. I don't. I know Jim Ross knows a lot more about wrestling than me, but I don't feel that Jenna Mahal is ready for this spot. And thinks he needs to. I think he needs to be a little bit better in the ring. Setting aside the fact that I think Jinder Mahal is on steroids, um, I think Jinder Mahal needs to have went and had some success in the mid card before he went and tried to get involved in the top for the top billing right here. But the WWE needs a presence in India. Um, as we'll get to later on in the podcast, the uh, Impact Wrestling is going to be doing a tour there. WWE has sent the has sent Kobe Kingston and um, Big E over there, New Day, um, to uh, go on sort of a tour over there. I'm sure, they'll be doing some some wrestling in some degree. But we'll see what happens uh, at uh, Backlash. It might be um, that Jinder Mahal goes over and pins Randy Orton to become the WWE Champion. I wouldn't be surprised to me at all um, if if he did that. Considering that the WWE wants a presence over there, I would not keep the belt on Jinder Mahal very long. 
Uh, I would have went Randy Orton win the belt back him back from him at the next pay per view in a month, and let Jim Derhalt Mahal do a tour over there, and then drop the title back to Randy Orton. If I was doing this, Jim Mahal is just so inept in the ring. I don't. I'm not. I mean, he can do some basic moves, but he doesn't have a presence like Goldberg has. I think that the WWE, sh everything in the WWE seems to be, they want it right now. They don't want to have any slow build on any, any talent if they're not in NXT. In NXT, we do have slow build on talent as we'll get into a discussion on the NXT review here in just a few moments. Well, with Jinder Mahal, there has no been, there hasn't been a slow build. Let's go back and let's look, let's look at, um, and let's remember, I know a lot of wrestling fans wasn't around then, but let's look and see, they needed a, they need a transitional champion that was a heel back during the to get the belt on Hulk Hogan and because it it was on Bob Backlund back Bob Backlund was a good guy Hulk Hogan was a good guy so they needed a transitional champion well they began to build up they built up for a short period of time they built up the Iron Sheik the Iron Sheik however is legit you know former Olympian I guess it was a different time but he won the championship here in a few, there in just a few months. You know, then Hulk Hogan come, and we all know come over from the AWA, and then we had the uh, then we had the era of Hulkamania, which was huge. And but look, go back there, go back on. Um, not sure if it's on the WWE Network, but I know there are some places on places on YouTube. That shows this core uh, classy Freddie Glassy was the mouthpiece for the Iron Sheik. Jinder Mahal, he don't need a mouthpiece. He he does fine, but it is just so that it is that he is so inept in the ring, and that he continues to be stiff in the ring with people too. Uh, during this six man tag match, it, he. Sami Zayn had some spots, and he legitimately, Sami Zayn was bleeding out of his mouth after being in the ring with Jinder Mahal. I mean, the guy is stiff to work with, and, you know, I hope that he doesn't get in the ring with Randy Orton, and he's the same way, because tendencies, if he is the same way with Randy Orton, that he is being stiff with these other guys, there's a chance that uh, he might be future endeavored from the WWE because Randy Orton is not going to uh, put up with being someone being stiff and unsafe inside of the ring because regardless of what you think and regardless of uh, of Randy Orton being a boring champion, the one thing remains true is that Randy Orton is smooth in the ring and he is great in the ring at what he does. And... He expects people that he gets into the ring with to be on his level. Jinder Mahal is not at that level. He's not at the level of, he's not been built up as Goldberg. And there's no way that he is a Goldberg, you know, if you're going to build that, that type of character, like uh, the, the uh, ultimate warrior type character. You can't do that with Jinder Mahal. Jinder Mahal is a heel. And he's a good heel with the interference, with the promos. Good work. But then the bell rings, and he's lackluster. He doesn't provide a presence in the ring. And I hope that when he that here at Backlash, that it isn't a dud, and that Jinder Mahal does seem like a legitimate champion. We all know that we all want the WWE to be New Japan Pro Wrestling. We want the WWE to be Ring of Honor. The WWE is not a wrestling company. The WWE is an entertainment company. We have to make that certain 
we have to make that distinction. Vince McMahon has said on numerous times that he is not in the wrestling business. He is in the entertainment business. And but there are still there's some there still has to be a legitimacy of the stars that you put in that ring that they come across like they deserve to be there. And Jinder Mahal, I'm afraid, is just going to be a flash in the pan. And after he's done with this, he's not going to amount to nothing. I hope that I'm wrong. But I feel that that is what it is going to be. It's time and time again you see people that have been there for one or two championship matches and then they go away. And But there has not been a solid build on Jinder Mahal. He's been an enhancement talent. He's been one an enhancement talent that has that that yes he looks tremendous regardless of how he got there how he looks tremendous he looks tremendous. I've heard that he has a good attitude and that's great. But if you can't go in the ring, if you don't look legitimate in the ring, if you have to be protected in the ring, here we are a week away. We have one more SmackDown before the pay-per-view. And Jinder Mahal is still botching people in the ring. That's not good. That's not good at all. And it's more than looking the part. You have to be the part. And you have to play to your strengths and your strengths. And I don't see any strengths that Jinder Mahal has in the ring. At all. At all. He has a weak finisher which is being sold wonderfully. I mean, but it, you know, it doesn't do anything for me. Maybe it's maybe it's a finisher that they have come up with that is safe where he can't injure people with. But and then you have his spots in the ring where he hurts where he causes the opponents to bleed and this isn't this isn't, you know, MMA. This is wrestling and it's a work. And there's a reason why, and this is a WWE, and I continue to see this time and time again. And Jinder Mahal needs to get with Randy Orton, they need to go somewhere, and they need to plan out their match completely of what they're going to do. Uh, Goldberg, Lesnar, I feel that they got somewhere, and they went over their match, they practiced their match, and their five-minute match was better than some of the 10, 20, 30-minute matches that we have seen in a WWE recently at WrestleMania. It was good. It told a story, and it accomplished what it needed to accomplish. Both looked legit in the ring. Both was believable in the ring. I don't believe anything that's, that Jinder Mahal says in the ring as far as telling me a story in the ring that he hits one move and it knocks somebody out. But before the other moves that he does that he has in the ring can legitimately cause the that is that could legitimately causes somebody to be injured and we don't want that. We don't want no botches. We don't want no more concussions off of guys. Learn how to do your shit or get out. That's what I say. And and uh if you haven't learned your craft for being in the WWE for seven years, there's a chance that you're not going to learn your craft from not from anymore. And he's worked on the independent circle, and still he comes up to where he looks like he is a rookie in the ring. And and I that's my issue. That's one of my issues. The steroid thing is one issue. That's my one issue with Jinder Mahal. And this is the only guy, I guess they. this is the only guy of Indian descent that the WWE has. It shows that they need to expand in this era. Let him win. Let him get the title. Let him, hopefully he doesn't hurt anybody. Hopefully he doesn't botch any moves on Randy Orton. Hopefully he doesn't concuss Randy Orton. And... And we'll probably discuss this again on my thoughts on the preview for Backlash. Uh, but then get the title off of him after he does his tour of India so we all can move on. Then get him in a mid-card program where he can get in there and, and bring something and learn some things in the ring where he is effective at what he does. 
You have to be effective at what you, at your craft for what you do to make it believable to me as a wrestling fan. That's what I got to say on that. Next, 205 Live. We had Mustafa Ali versus Tony Nese. First, we had a a good little segment with Austin Aries and Jack Gallagher, where Jack Gallagher and uh, Austin Aries shared a pint of beer and a gentleman's toast. Neville come out and tried to interrupt them, but after when after uh, Aries uh, Aries and Jack Gallagher run them off, they shared their pint of beer. It was a good little segment. Enjoyed it. It was short, brief, but it was to the point. Mustafa Ali versus Tony Nese. This was a good match. There were many. There was a lot of that flippy shit, as they said in this match, but not too much. Not too much. There was a couple of spots. Mustafa Ali uh, finished the match with a 450 slash on Tony Nese. Both guys look good, and both look legit. We get a promo of Cedric Alexander, and that he will be returning. We get some backstage uh, uh, goings on with uh, Alicia Fox and uh, Rich Swan and Noam Dar. Noam Dar said that for what he's done to them, for what said, for what uh, Rich Swan had done to them as a couple, that they, that they was going to get uh, some revenge. It looked, it looked pretty good. Then we get a, a match between. Atira Azawa and Brian Kendrick. First, we had a promo um, with another with another one of the talents there. I can't think of his name. I'm sorry, and it was okay. But then we come to the match. The Atira Tozawa and Brian Kendrick. It was a good match. Um, uh, Atira Tozawa defeated Brian Kendrick with a roll up. Then this match went about ten minutes. Then Kendrick attacked Azawa Tozawa after the match. Said he was done with him. He was done with this feud. Uh, I liked this match. I thought that it was good too. We had two good matches here. It would be nice if 205 Live had either a tag team, had a, had a tag team. My suggestion is that 205 Live have a six man tag uh, championship, which would be fantastic. They would have to feature a little bit. They would have to feature some more uh, people on the show, but it would be it would be a championship where you could get more people involved with the limited time that they have. Uh, all in all, it was a good. Sh it was a good show. Uh, Talking Smack uh, was there. It was dismal. I didn't like it at all. I just want to go ahead and throw that out because I'm not covering it in the news. Uh, then we had uh, Wednesday night. We had NXT, and the highlights of this uh, show was Aleister Black. Aleister Black had a two-minute match, but it was effective. Uh, the guy that he was. Uh, Fight, uh, fighting uh, Caesar Borneo, I guess that's how you pronounce that. From it was from Br Brazil. Uh, it lasted for two minutes, and then uh, he then Alistair Black caught uh, Borneo with uh, with the Black Mass a roundhouse kick and wins. Uh, Alistair Black is on a good build for NS NXT. There's been some comments. That has been in wrestling that uh, that they feel that that people fans feel that Aleister Black is going to the main roster in uh, Raw or, or going to SmackDown because he's been Euro used on the European tour. I want to say that I doubt that that's going to happen. They're just using Aleister Black because he is a guy that people recognizes uh, as his independent name. Tommy End was they recognize him. And it's a good way to get people to come out to the show. Alistair Black is had is having a solid build, as with as with when they have these guys like Alistair Black come in. Triple H and the creative team in NXT does a great job in building them. I look for Alistair Black to remain in NXT for at least a year, and he does need to remain in NXT for a year and be the NXT champion. Eventually, then go to the main roster. Now that he look, he's a year. Eh, he's about a year away. I would say I would look, and as I look for Adam Cole to go to NXT, Alistair Black would be a good guy for Al to fight. Um, 
um, Adam Cole, or he would be a good even with uh, um, Cassius Ono, Chris Hero. I don't know why they changed his name because WWE has to change has to own everything. Hero's such a much better name, but uh, look for that maybe a feud to go on there. Uh, we have a little segment. In NXT, the highlight of the women's match is that uh, since Asuka interfered in the women's number one contender match, Battle Royal, that she'll be facing all four women, but uh, Amber Moon will not be in that match. She was legitimately, legitimately injured. Nasty bump uh, that uh, she'd be out four to five weeks. Nasty bump that she took throwing her outside of the ring, what Asuka did to her. So it'll be Nikki Cross, Ruby Riot, and Oscar for the NXT Women's Championship at Takeover Chicago, which will be a good match. There's a segment through uh, there was a promo segment for Ruby Riot and Nikki Cross. I uh, was really impressed with Nikki Cross. She does such a great job on her promos. Really look forward to uh, seeing her. Uh, win the NXT championship if it was me when Oscar goes to the Oscar goes to uh, the uh, main roster I would have Nikki Cross be the one to defeat her uh, I don't I know they're gonna play maybe this story up with uh, with Amber Moon it seems that they're going back and forth from Oscar being a heel being a face really don't matter with Asuka. She is whatever she wants to be. She's She has been on a winning streak longer than that of Goldberg now in the old WCW, which is awesome. And the build on Asuka has been monumental. I think that you keep Asuka in NXT until SummerSlam. You keep Asuka in NXT until Slummer, SummerSlam, then you move her up. Uh, then we had a promo uh, that at NXT TakeOver that it would be Pete Dunne versus uh, Tyler Bate for the UK Championship. Look forward to that. Pete Dunne, legit heel. Uh, and this is going to be the rivalry, main rivalry going forward when the, when the WWE launches their... Um, new uh, UK uh, programming. Uh, we Then we had DIY versus Riddick Moss and uh, Tino Sabatelli. We had a promo for Velveteen Dream, which you know didn't really do anything for me. Um, DIY, the most important thing out of this segment of DIY is a regal come out and he announced that there would be a stipulation at the match between uh, the authors of pain and between DIY going one on one for the NXT championship that it would be a ladder match that would be a lot of fun I look forward to that uh, we had uh, Cassius Ono call out Almas which ought to be a decent match that will happen next week um, I would don't know why they're doing that there. I wish that they would just save that for NXT TakeOver Chicago since it's just around the corner. Uh, then we had our main event of the evening. Lasted uh, 16 minutes, I believe. And this was... Uh, Had Hideo Akami, Atami versus... Sorry about the pronunciation. Versus Roderick Strong. Was a good match, good hard fought match. It looked good, um, good back and forth. Both looked decent. As I looked at, as I look at Hideo Itami and I look at Roderick Strong, my thoughts is these two guys would be great for 205 Live. Um, I think that they would get lost in the shuffle. If they were on uh, SmackDown or if they were on Raw as part of that roster, but as part of 205 Live, I believe that they would shine 
and both of them would be contenders for the um, Cruiserweight Championship. Would love to see Hideo Itami versus uh, King Neville for the championship. That would be quite entertaining. At the end of this match, Hideo Itami goes over, so it will be Hideo Itami versus uh, Bobby Roode for the NXT Championship at NXT TakeOver, which I will tell you now I'm going to pick Bobby Roode to go over Hideo Itami. It's good Hideo Itami is back. It's good to see that he is still um, in the mix now that he is, it's good to see he is in the mix now for the championship and that he is healthy. And we hope that he continues to be healthy. That is my review of the WWE uh, events for the week. And now let's move on to other news and TNA reviews. Not TNA. Let's move on to Impact Review. It's still TNA to me. It's I haven't. I, no matter what people say, I, I I'm not a fan of Impact Wrestling. Not anything wrong with the guys, but Impact Wrestling is holding us back from the broken gimmick. Fuck that out. All right. This is this is going on to our Impact Wrestling review. This is your impact results and review for May 11th, 2017. The main event for tonight's impact wrestling show was Alberto El Patron versus Magnus for the GWF Global Force Wrestling Championship. Overall, the show was decent, but again, it was impact wrestling, so we will have to see how it turns out in the future of things. As you know, I'm very honest and open with my feelings towards Impact Wrestling, but still, we'll cover this out of respect for the performers that are in the ring. We have, first off, we have an X Division match. It features Matt Seidel, Cable Conley, and De versus Desmond Xavier and Andrew Everett. A very fast paced match. I will say that the Impact Wrestling is letting the Cruiserweights do what they do best. They are letting them fly. Uh, this definitely is not the WWE style. Uh, it could be something that Impact Wrestling could capitalize on. Uh, it's more of a Japanese style of uh, what we are going to see in the Super Junior uh, Tournament coming up in New Japan Pro Wrestling. But still, it's a six-sided ring. I don't like the six-sided ring. Um, it was made for TV, so it was a little fast-paced, I would say. Uh, the guys are just going too fast. There's not very much selling. All it is is a series of high spots, which that really gets old for me after a while. Uh, a lot of flips, but in the end... Uh, we have Seidel charges Xavier to the corner. Seidel, Franken driver, Everett covers for the one, two, three winner. Andrew Everett by a Franken driver. Um, I know some don't like this move. And also, I will say it was a little bit fast paced, but it is a little bit different style of the X Division. I will say that. Uh, later on in the program, it was announced for next week that Ultimate X is going to come back. If you don't know what Ultimate X is, uh, go uh, check out Christopher Daniels and some of those uh, Ultimate X matches on YouTube. They are quite entertaining and they ought to uh, highlight the X division. I I guess, you know, we can call the X division two, sort of like 205 Live, but I don't know. I, it's I can respect the fact that they're letting the these cruiserweights fly, but still there's just a lot of action happening really fast. Uh, which if you like that style of wrestling, then you know more power to you. But I 
like it where people are actually telling a story in the ring instead of just doing a bunch of high spots. Uh, then we had more of the ongoing saga of between Jeremy Borash and Josh Matthews. I wish they would end this crap. Um, you know, it's one thing that I just don't like about Impact Wrestling is this ongoing announcer's feud, which, as Jim Ross said, it's not going to draw a damn dime, and that it is uh, pretty much a reason not to tune in. Um, but it is what it is. It's a storyline that they're going to go with, but it's annoying as hell. Then we have EC3 come out. And earlier in the day, I guess he put out a, a promo that EC3 was going to rip into James Storm. And he come out in a generic cowboy garb. Uh, he went through basically making fun of James Storm being a cowboy. Uh, it was really kind of, uh, it wasn't comical, I found it kind of stupid. And lame joke it wasn't very. I didn't think that it was very entertaining. Well, anyway, James Storm comes out. Of course, his music hits to retaliate against him being made fun of, and ends up that Easy Three puts James Storm uh, in some handcuffs, and where and where he can't get out, that is attached to the ring, and then he proceeds to take a belt and beat him. Um, don't know if this is a visual that you really want in today's world. Uh, his back was red. It looked like that he really uh, kayfabe this pretty well. You know, it would be nice that they would go from here maybe having a, a Texas uh, uh, bull rope match is what they would say that or... Uh, I think that those are pretty entertaining, but I doubt that they do anything like that. More, again, of the announcers going on and harassing each other. Boring, annoying, please get off my TV. And then we go to uh, GFW Tag Team Championship Match Tournament. Um... I guess they're going to keep keep the brands, even though they merge. They're going to keep the titles for both brands, which is kind of I would say uh, maybe they need to do it like the old WCW, make one the national title, make the other the U.S. and make one the world title, which would make sense. I don't know exactly what they're going to be planning here. This is another uh, basically cruiserweight style match of tag teams. There was a lot of high flying here. A lot of high spots. Um, the the kid. Uh, it was between uh, Hakeem Zayn and Adiris Abraham versus Garza Jr. and Laredo Kid. Um, uh, the Laredo Kid picked up the win here with a 450 splash to Garza from Garza to Abraham just on the outside, and the kid covers. Zane for the one, two, three. Uh, winners was Garza Jr. and Laredo Kid. Um, both men then cut a promo in the back with the interviewer. Garza says that they're going to go on and represent Mexico and they're the best team in the world. And the kid says they're ready for anything and nothing can stop them. Um, more power to them. Uh, Another high flying match. Uh, it's cruiser. It can be entertaining having a cruiserweight championship, which, if they keep it in that respect, it would be good. But they need to do something a little bit different. I think they need to make the GFW title, maybe like the national or the America's title, and then um, and same thing with the with the tag team championships from GFW. Again, we go on to another match, Ava Story versus Laura Van Ness. Laura Van Ness stumbles around and yells. She comes out with uh, Congo Khan. Um, 
really weird uh, sort of a combination here she's in a wedding dress and she ended up getting the victory over Ava's story and she with curb stomp I guess that found out that's a safe move now in uh, at least in impact wrestling which I don't think is a very safe move um, they celebrate in the ring and then we move on to LAX burial of decay that's up next we get a short vignette of rockstar spud being beaten by swoggle again and laid out uh, for the foreseeable foreseeable future good cinematography they're doing this quite well I know rockstar spud has been on uh, Twitter He's actually doing some interviews he's keeping up the kayfabe in this and it's good I mean he's I know Swoggle is sort of a comedy act and uh, and maybe Rockstar Spud deserves a little bit better than this being buried like this but uh, he's doing a good job with the kayfabe uh, injury storyline he's not breaking kayfabe on this and for once a wrestler in current form is not breaking kayfabe in the United States. Rockstar Spud is from England, but um, it's good to see. And LAX comes out when they get back from commercial break, and they are going through the motions of burying the decay. Um, as we as as in wrestling news, Crazy Steve actually is signed with the WWE and NXT they most suspect that they're going to be bringing him in as a member of Sanity which would be really good that or maybe they could bring him in directly to uh, Smackdown Live uh, and pair him with Eric Rowan which would be a good uh, pairing you know they could do some crazy clowns heard that uh, actually Eric Rowan is has a clown costume that he's been working on in some house shows um, which uh, we'll get to the WWE's philosophy in, on the house shows versus TV there was a good interview this week between uh, that, that aired between Stone Cold Steve Austin on Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast and when he interviewed Shane McMahon and you can understand the WWE's point of view and what he said but anyway, getting back to LAX, um, really doing the going on to the anti-American uh, gimmick uh, that they've they're Latinos and they've been discriminated against. Conan, it's, it's this is such an old this is such an old routine that it, you know it's I think it was done done back when it was when it when it was there when it was first started during the early 2000s um, it's really lost its uh, luster so next they'd be going for the GFW Tag Team Championships too Impact Wrestling Impact Wrestling was full of broken promises then there was a guy in the crowd that started waving an American flag uh, Conan started saying that he was getting pissed off that he was going to take that flag and shove it up the guy's ass and tells the guy that the flag is about useful as toilet paper um, this embroils the crowd of course it's great getting heel heat what Conan does here and then comes the new tag team that they have uh, Impact is pushing Veterans of War, um, which is two Marine veterans. And they come and they lay waste to LAX, and LAX retreats from the ring. So that's the story. That's who they're setting up to go after the Tag Team Championships against the LAX. You know, as a note here, uh, Impact Wrestling really holds a really sort of 
I don't know. Seems like if someone goes on, if they're burying them a little bit, like Crazy Steve, instead of like wishing them the best, um, the Decay and the Hardys held the tag divisions, and they were the biggest draw and the must-watch TV that you know that was in uh, that was in Impact Wrestling or TNA for a while when it was TNA. It's really sad to see that they're just completely pissing all over Decay because, you know, for the Hardys, Batman has got to have his Joker. Superman has got to have his Lex Luger, and the Hardys, to do their broken gimmick, had to needed Decay, and Decay was a big, integral part of that uh, run for the Hardys and what they were doing with the broken universe. And is you know, I don't know, it's just like, it seems that just any little thing that the impact can, can do to, to feather, you know, just sort of stick it to that, that they're so unappreciative of what the Hardys did and based, keeping the doors open. Uh, so Anthem would have the right, even to the, even the opportunity to buy Impact. Uh, it's really classless, you know. The hashtag fuck that owl. This is the reason why that I have such animosity towards Impact Wrestling. I appreciate the guys and the girls that work there. Appreciate what Bruce Pritchard and Dutch Bantel are doing like to see them succeed but there's a you know you have that you have that another company with that overtone that uh, you know that wants to just stick it to the talent and that's not to me that's not very professional next we have uh, the, the impact grand championship that is uh, that is going to be um, defended. And if any of you know what the Impact Grand Championship is, it's three rounds. And they have three judges. And then they total up the score. If there's a draw, the one that wins the draw uh, wins the uh, uh, wins the championship. It, and Marshy Rocket challenging moves for the Impact Grand Championship. Um, bell rings and rocket charges kicks. It goes to the first round and then we have the first round scorecard and Moose wins the first round. I think this concept's a load of crap. Um, you know, um, do they really think that... I mean, this is professional wrestling. I don't like this concept. Um... Is you know they want to make it something different, something new. I think it's a little bullshit. Uh, let the guys wrestle because most of the time it's always going to come to three rounds. This time it didn't. Moose picked up the win at the end of the round too. Uh, but it is to me it's a it's complete waste of time. They're trying to legitimize the. Re professional wrestling making it comparable to MMA and uh, that's just not going to happen pro wrestling is pro wrestling get rid of the judges and let them wrestle that's what I gotta say um, uh, you know I mean it's a little bit corny to be honest uh, after Moose picks up the win Tyrus comes down uh, to the impact zone and then Eli Drake was behind him and they start beating up um, Moose. Uh, Moose has improved a lot over the last few months. And all of a sudden Chris Adonis, who is Chris Masters, former star of the WWE, puts um, Moose in the Adonis lock, which was called the Master Lock. And they, uh, 
just beat up Moose, and I guess that they're going to to do something. You know, the the Eli either Eli Drake Moose, uh, the Eli Drake Tyrus, or Adonis is going to be challenging Moose for the Impact Grand Championship. Which, who cares? Get to see Chris Masters back on TV. Get to see Chris Adonis back on TV. But who cares? Um, next, we do get the announcement that the Egg Ultimate X, that Dutch Mantel, uh, bringing Ultimate X back to the fans. Um, where Trevor Lee, Andrew Everett, will challenge Loki for the X Division Championship in an Ultimate X match next week. Um, ought to be entertaining. Like Low Key's doing something a little bit different. He's actually competing in a suit and tie, which is kind of funny. Um, it's sort of that uh, get sort of that uh, nineteen um, or uh, twenty twenty-ish or sort of the Jet Li type character, a uh, Jet Li type character that does. Uh, does all of his moves in a suit and tie or video game character. It's interesting. It's different. It's a good gimmick. Uh, you to see Loki back in uh, on TV. He's been doing some moves. Uh, he's been doing some independence, but now it's seen back on TV. Uh, now we have uh, the main event, the GFW Global Championship match between Magnus versus Alberto El Patrol. Very good. Good match. Uh, Magnus does a good job. A lot of back and forth. Some near, a few near falls is in this, and uh, the crowd was seemed to be with this, which, um, you know, I mean, the crowd gets in for free at the Impact Zone uh, of Universal Studios. You know, it's still not a wrestling crowd that's coming out to this or not. You know, they're supposed to have dates where they're going to go. It's still not, you know, a, a per se wrestling crowd. I mean, they, they cheer a little bit, but eh, it's okay. Uh, but at the Alberto El Patron picks up the win with his patented armbar on Magnus. Magnus taps out and your new GWF World Heavyweight Champion is Alberto Del Patron. Alberto El Patron says afterwards in a little video which check out said that he came to Impact Wrestling because he was looking for a place to finally call home and thanks to all the fans this is now his house. Uh, Patron, mean, uh, Patron admits he borrowed that phrase from his fiance. He does mention Paige's name, which is hilarious, um, since she's still under contract with the WWE. Uh, regardless, uh, regarding Magnus, he praised him uh, for uh, for being a great competitor. That Magnus was a good competitor. He had held the GWF Championship since October 23rd, 2015. So, he's held it for a little while. I don't know how, exactly how much the... I know that Magnus has uh, wrestled in, uh, in the UK for a while. I don't know how many events that actually the GFW actually had, but he's been held this belt for a long time. Um... When he won it, uh, between Magnus defeated Bobby Roode to become the inaugural, cha inaugural champion. Still, it tells you now how long that this has happened since Bobby Roode now is with the uh, NXT WWE, and he's doing very well. Um, so, as a quick recap on what happened at the show, Andrew Everett defeated Matt Seidel and Caleb Conley and Desmond Xavier in the X Division match. The Laredo Kid and Garza Jr. defeated Ardi Ardias Abraham and Hakeem Zane. 
uh, Lauren Van Ness defeated Ava Story, Moose defeated Marcia Rocket to retain the Impact Grand Championship. Oh, I forgot to mention the Alicia Edwards uh, defeated Angelina Love uh, via disqualification. Uh, good little feud going between these two and their husbands, um, which is a little bit intriguing. Um, got a good Angelina Love has a good uh, gimmick going there with a uh, husband. I believe it's her husband or uh, or her or boyfriend, Davy Richards. I'm not sure. Uh, it doesn't matter, but. Um, we see here that, uh, and that it's a good little few that they got going on. So an interesting comments is that Bobby Lashley said before the GFW Championship match tonight that that he always likes to collect gold and that uh, he might collect the GFW Championship belt as well. Surely this is setting up uh, GFW the. Alberto El Patron versus Bobby Lashley at uh, Slammiversary, which is definitely the money match that everybody probably wants to see in full. Um, you know, everybody wants to see. I'll probably get the results and watch it. I doubt I buy this pay per view, uh, but uh, we'll see how it goes. I'll have the results and publish them here on my channel. Uh, so this is your TN or not your TNA, your Impact Wrestling uh, review. Congratulations to Alberto El Patron, the new GFW Championship. It's good to see that he's on TV where he belongs. He is a star. He is he is good in the ring. I enjoy his work. Uh, regardless of all the extracurricular stuff that goes on, regardless of his feelings towards the WWE and his comments and what people say about him, you know, he's entertaining and he, you know, he's one of the top wrestlers that's out there, especially on the independent market. Would love to see him, as I said before, in New Japan Pro Wrestling. He needs to be on a premier stage instead of lost in the shuffle at TNA Wrestling at Impact Wrestling. You know, um, it's good that people have a place to work. I really can't stand the, the upper, the how the the executive part of this uh, company. I don't know if uh, if Jeff Jarrett is uh, involved with uh, some of the contract negotiations or he's just a liaison that's trying to get the uh, the He's trying to get Impact to be a vibrant company again. Um, I think the contract negotiations are actually other officials in uh, Impact Wrestling. Uh, they're trying to make it to where that if somebody signs with Impact Wrestling, the Impact Wrestling, then their independent uh, their independent shows that they get that Impact Wrestling gets a percentage of their um their independent bookings like up to 10 percent so, so if you imagine if you had an appearance fee and you got two thousand dollars you get two thousand dollars one place you get a tour of europe two thousand you ended up ten thousand dollars then a thousand of that dollars would go to impact wrestling and also they're actually trying to to get and own the rights of many of the talent that is there that they would be exclusive to Impact Wrestling and talents would not be able to use their personalities when they go to other companies such as the WWE which you know you know they can do what they want to do the Hardys are the ones that come up with the ideas of the broken universe um, it was under different leader it was under different ownership and impact and they should have just let the Hardys go uh, people want to agree to that a uh, town wants uh, to agree to that their likeness and everything that they own comes into impact wrestling I think impact wrestling needs to grow a little bit before they start pushing those uh, before they start pushing that sort of demands on 
independent wrestlers. But it is a good place to go to get your face on TV, to get some some training and exposure, and then leave and go to the W and go to NXT, where you can actually become a star or to New, New Japan Pro Wrestling or Ring of Honor. Um, so that is my take on Impact Wrestling for this week. I promise not to harp on it in our news section, not unless there's just something dramatic that's going to come out uh, on the news section. And thank you for, for listening to the Impact Review this week. Ring of Honor held their annual pay-per-view War of the World show in New York City at the iconic Hammerstein Ballroom uh, last night. It featured New Japan Pro Wrestling and Ring of Honor uh, superstars. Both promotions co-produced the event, and it's one of Ring of Honor's biggest show of of the year. Headlines of the show consisted of uh, Marty Skrull, the villain, to defend his TV championship against Matt Seidel. Uh, Adam Cole to face New Japan Pro Wrestling's Ace Rock, and who is the rock star of New Japan Pro Wrestling, Hiroshi Tanahashi, and a triple threat match for the Ring of Honor World Championship um, with Christopher Daniels, the Ring of Honor champion, defending his title against Cody Rose and Jay Lethal. It was a pretty good show. Um, and Ring of Honor does a good, does a good match, and it highlighted the showcase both of the promotions and also furthered New Japan's role here in the United States expansion. The show began with uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling officials coming to the ring and showcasing a new tournament that would be at the G1 Classic for the new United States Championship, the IWGP United States Championship, uh, would be a round-robin tournament and consisting of be on July 1st and July 2nd in Los Angeles. Uh, the belt looks fantastic. Um, it looks like a big, huge. There's pictures of it on uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling 1972.com or in New Japan Pro Wrestling on uh, Twitter. You can take a look at the belt. It looks like an old time, big, huge boxing belt. Uh, they really outdid themselves, but it really showcases that New Japan is serious about expanding here in the United States. Getting to the pay-per-view, uh, the, the pay-per-view started off with a Four Corners survival match. It's kind of a crazy match with uh, Dalton Castle, Castle and uh, Kuchi and Bobby Fish and Silas Young. Uh, Dal Dalton Castle come out with the uh, win here. Uh, it was pretty, pretty entertaining. And then we... pretty entertaining for... You know, a, um, a match to start off the uh, the pay-per-view. And then we go to uh, Hangman Page versus Frankie Karzarian. Uh, Hangman Page defeated uh, Hangman Karzarian. Then we had War Machine versus uh, Evil and Sonata versus uh, Chris Sabin and Jonathan Gesham. Um, War Machine come out on top. War Machine is being pushed in both promotions pretty well. They're they're pretty amazing. Um, uh, it was a good match. Uh, then we had Will Offspring uh, versus Jay White. Uh, Will Offspring uh, looked amazing again. Uh, he defeated him, and you know all Will Offspring's matches are pretty good. Jay White looks good, continues to look more and more, uh, improves with every match. Then we have the Ring of Honor uh, six-man team championship match with Bully Ray and the Briscoes. 
uh, defeated uh, Hiroki Goto, Rop Rapagoti Vice. It was a diff It was a pretty entertaining match. Bully Ray and the Briscoes come out on top after um, Rocky takes a uh, 3D, and Bully Ray and the Briscoes retain the uh, championship. Next, we have the Ring of Honor uh, World uh, Television Championship match with Marty Scurll and Matt Seidel. Matt Seidel is an amazing athlete. Uh, gave a great match. Marty Scurll did a great job here also. Um, and got the win via chicken wing uh, submission. Then we had uh, the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championship on the line. The Young Bucks versus uh, Tetsuo Nato and Bushi. Uh, this was a good match. Uh, the Young Bucks uh, ended up coming out with the victory. Of course, Naito had some great spots. Uh, Matt... Uh, uh, the Young Bucks got uh, the mist of Bushi all on his face. But still, they were able to retain the championship. Good spots, good match. Young Bucks are amazing. Then we had uh, Tanahashi versus Adam Cole. Uh, it was a good, solid match. As many suspect, this was Adam Cole's last match in Ring of Honor. Uh, so, Tanahashi defeated Adam Cole. Uh, perhaps the highlight of the night was what happened after this match is that uh, Kenny Omega showed up uh, after Adam Cole's loss and he fired Adam Cole from the Bullet Club and in the words of Kenny Omega every story has a hero but it must have a villain and so we see that Cole was replaced in the villain, uh, in the Bullet Club by Marty Squirrel, the villain, and Cole got super kicked by the Bucks, and uh, Marty uh, debuted his new Bullet Bullet Club umbrella, and so now we have that Cole rides off into the sunset, and then. He's probably going to be ended up in WWE NXT, probably be completely repackaged, and he was going to be a good fit for the WWE uh, system. Expect great things out of Adam Cole in NXT as he moves on to bigger and better things and becomes a superstar. Um... Lastly, we have the Ring of Honor World Championship match. It was a back-and-forth match. Good spots uh, here in this match. Uh, me, personally, I was hoping Cody Rhodes would win. Uh, I think that the Ring of Honor went with a with a sure thing on the win here. Somebody that's going to be around. Don't know exactly where Cody's going to be. He's, you know, he goes from... A lot of he's really in demand and the independent wrestling scene, but he's signed with uh, Ring of Honor, so you have more freedom to do that. Maybe a little bit later on, we'll see uh, Cody Rhodes win the Ring of Honor championship. Uh, the last sequence of the match, Cody Rhodes had Jay Lethal and a figure four. When Daniels was knocked to the outside, Daniels recovered, climbed to the top rope, and hit his signature move, the best moonsault ever, pinned Cody Rose for the nice one, two, three. And there we have the pay-per-view of Ring of Honor World, War, War, Ring of Honor War of Worlds results from last night. Good championship. If you want to check it out, you can check it out on the Fight Network on pay-per-view. Now we're going to move on to this week in wrestling. Uh, there's a lot of news out there in the world of wrestling. Some things I want to discuss. Um, some positive things that really gives us and lets us go into <clears throat> see into the mind of WWE and, and a few stories that we have here in some of the direction some of these things are not news or just rumors we'll distinguish between the two 
I don't really like to get into a whole lot of rumors maybe kicking around and gives us some ideas on which way the WWE should go. We have to remember that the WWE teases a lot of things, releases a lot of uh, things of what they're may be planning to do to try to get social media exactly how that the, the WWE universe would respond to it and see if this is a direction that they want to go. First off news was an interesting interview this week that Shane McMahon was on the Steve Austin show. I recommend everyone go to uh, the Steve Austin show podcast and listen to it. Uh, on his uh, podcast that he had this last Tuesday. and But we're going to paraphrase some of the things that was, that was uh, said. The main thing that we can take away from this Shane McMahon interview I found most interesting not only was his history in, in the wrestling business uh, and how that he was groomed for, for the wrestling business, and it didn't really get into his departure from the wrestling business, but Stone Cold mostly dealt with the the facts of uh, his involvement at the current time and the current uh, state of the WWE and the WWE universe. Uh, he got into the issue with Shane Man on the differences between talent's freedom of what they had back during the Attitude Era and what they have today, the different and why that that it seems that superstars are walking on eggshells um, because that they have nowhere else to go to make the big money like they did back during the Attitude Era of the WCW and the um, and so they're hampered with the creative process that it comes from the spontaneity of being creative so we and he asked Shane Man if that he felt that at times that the locker room that the guys in the locker room were walking on uh, eggshells and for you know what product that we see on TV Shane was very nice and cordial very informative and really got into we I think that we got in to be able to speak into the sort of the psyche of what WWE's current product is. Uh, he said that it's hard for someone on TV to tell a complete story in four minutes because they have because TV time is limited and they have to cut uh, a lot of the elements out and go straight to the heat you know and uh, to, to basically just give a short version of a longer version portion of the story on when they have an opportunity to do so on Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. Today people are really hampered by the lack of a territorial system that overall the people are limited with the the maturing process that's in the business of going from place to place to work and the WWE has artificially tried to make this uh, to create I mean try to create this in NXT first they attempted to do this with the original concept of relaunching the ECW brand to have guys from the main roster to go down to um, ECW and sort of groom the younger talents that was coming up. Uh, probably the only real talent that we can think of that was groomed and that was any successful out of the old out of the ECW the WWE's ECW brand was Bobby Lashley 
and we all know he's in Impact Wrestling today. But also we had CM Punk that come from the ECW brand, who was a Paul Heyman guy, and arguably become one of the greatest superstars in recent memory. And, of course, CM Punk is no longer with the WWE. Is if we really see anything that come out of that era, but it, the ECW was just, because of many different reasons, was, uh, did not develop into the the first envisioned the first envisioned pro, uh, product that they that the WWE wanted it to be, and everything was toned down from the original ECW, and uh, and also the WWE is majorly toned down because you know from the Attitude Era uh, that they had to tone down you know all of the risque and the uh, some of the you know the barbed wire matches and the you know and things of that nature but they've added elements into that in the WWE but with the WWE <clears throat> with the WWE um, spin on things and the WWE has to do that today because of avatar because to main because they have advertisers and they have a then society is different than what it was back during the attitude era and back during the ECW period stone cold went on to say stone stone cold then come back and said after Shane's um explanation you know that he recognized that you know in today's world we don't need a lot of the risk, more risque things that was presented during the Attitude Era. But what he would like to see is the creativity and the spontaneity of that creativity that was during the Attitude Era that created one of the, the largest era of, of uh, revenue generating um, wrestling that there has ever been and part of this was also that the WWE was competing with WCW and when the competition was there we got you know more we got more uh, we got a better product the fans got a better product um, and so he asked Shane if he felt like the current roster was too micromanaged so that hindered some of the creative processes and given an example of this is on the promos that everything every word is scripted and the reason why that it is scripted is because the WWE has uh, advertisers and because that the WWE has to maintain a certain public image with being a publicly traded company and which is understandable they have to to run a profit they have to run a profitable business so Shane said that first what we had to do in looking at this issue is to separate Raw from Smackdown that actually even though it doesn't seem this way that Smackdown is a lot more spontaneous than what Raw is uh, that Raw is more regulated than the SmackDown product because Raw is the more traditional type product of what the WWE wants to produce of an entertainment show. Raw comes out of the old garden and the old concept of Raw and it's been around for so long. That creative team on SmackDown does attempt to try to tell more of a story and to try to give more opportunities to the talent and to create those opportunities for them to be just a little bit more spontaneous though it's still scripted. Stone Cold asked the difference between the NXT and the territorial system like the USWA that he come up in 
He said in the USWA, he said you had to, you know, change up your 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 matches on the next week because you was in the same town this had the same audience and if you just come out there and did the same match over and over again that people are not that the crowd is not going to get with you um and which is true and what we we see this a lot in some of the wwe that it seems that some of the talents they do not change up very much it's the same rendition over and over again which i think that this is a little bit sort of the issues that we have with some of the feuds that we've had going on the feuds between kevin owens and uh chris jericho or kevin owens title ring uh the same thing over and over week by week we was had Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns. Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns. There was no, you know, there was nothing new there. And and I think that this is a little bit of what uh, Stone Cold was try, trying to get to. Um, you know, Shane said really, really couldn't compare NXT per se to, you know, the territory system because it's an artificial system. Uh, the NXT is it doesn't have a promoter that that says if you don't go out there and don't get over then you know the crowd boos you that you're going to be ship you're going to be run out of town that the crowd sometimes and the people and the fans at NXT is a little bit too critical and too critical over what the the guys do the tapings um simply because that you know the talent is trying different things that they're learning and they're trying to connect to the crowd and it just is a process and it takes it takes time that that is one of the aspects of the wrestling business is you just can't teach a talent to have that charisma to have that connectivity to a crowd that it's really on the person themselves to connect to the crowd and it's a difficult art to teach therefore um, you know that's up to the person to be out there to go out there and to tell that good story and and they begin to relate the the story the interaction between Stone Cold and Shane McMahon back during their um, feud during the Attitude Era. Shane said that it was up to him as a heel to get the babyface over to be sure that they told a great story to sell, to make sure that uh, he did make it not only not able to sell, but not to oversell to make it believable uh, and to get heat and to make, again, the baby face to look good. Uh, and that, he, that, you know, when he was going in there on Raw, that he was going in there on, what well, he was going up against great talent. He wasn't the greatest performer in the ring, but, you know, he could get a reaction from the crowd, and that's what they're looking for is they're looking for a reaction from the crowd. It doesn't matter if it's a boo or if it's cheer. It's that the crowd is connecting to that um, talent. I feel that this interview, like I said before, gives us some insight into what the WWE as a whole is looking for in their talents and how that if you're going into the wrestling business, how that you are to connect to the crowd, that we have to understand that WWE has a system. And if you're not going to go into the WWE with the attitude of bucking the system, if you go into there and to that attitude that you're going to get fired and you're going to be released. One thing that I think that we have to understand also is that there is an independent 
uh, presence that is in wrestling, and it is relatively strong. We can take the person of Cody Rhodes, and Cody Rhodes has arguably been more successful on the independent scene than he was in the WWE finding his identity. And it is my personal, and people can do what they want to, it is my personal um, opinion that if a person is getting into wrestling, it is number one to get into a good wrestling school to be trained, uh, preferably a wrestling school that is attached to some type of promotion, and then to practice your art at very places. Uh, different promotions around the country. You have to realize that if you're going to wrestle, you're going to you're going to travel. If you're going to be in the wrestling business, you are going to have to travel. Um, there are a lot of promotions that are around, but make sure that you're connected to somewhere where you can learn and not just simply just be in one promotion all the time, but to to go to different promotions that's out there that's legitimate uh, nothing that's going to no promotion that's or a promoter that's going to um, ask you to do things that are unsafe or that could potentially injure you for life but legitimate um, wrestling promotions that's out there such as a uh, uh, wrestling circus uh, different ones uh, West Coast Wrestling Connection that's up in the Northeast there's different ones that's connected around uh, uh, um, there's uh, in in the Tommy Dreamers promotion and trying to develop your character yourself even if you have to go to uh, Impact Wrestling for a while uh, to get on TV, then do so. But I would not stay in. I would not stay in Impact. I would not stay in Impact for a long duration of time. That your end goal, if your end goal must be to reach the WWE or to reach, you know, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Go to Japan. Try it out. Um, you know, you may have to go to DDT first or, or NOAA first. Uh, it's a completely different style of wrestling. It is more strong style. And there's things that, you you know, you're going to have to go. It's more traditional um, pathway in Japan um, to be able to, to be successful. But the payoffs are you know, are great because Japan is one of the top promotions that there is or make a name for yourself here in the States. Go to Mexico. Go to AAA. Try those promotions out. CML. L. Um, and just be ready to travel. And you're not going to make a whole lot of money when you start out. But if you have the passion and you have the drive, then you can become successful and then get in when you have some so when you have some notoriety or you have some name have made some type of name for yourself on the independent circuit then then try to go to NXT where you're not completely green when you go to your tryout and get involved in that system but realize the WWE system is a, is a grind and that it is it's a grind to get there but it is uh, their way of doing things and the end goal of every person involved in wrestling and the wrestling business you know it should be everyone's goal to have that Wrestlemania moment uh, whether you're happy or whether you're, if it makes you happy uh, but the WWE isn't all and in all it is the pinnacle it is no one is going to be replacing the WWE anytime soon or even come close to competing with the WWE even with the New Japan Pro Wrestling coming into the United States 
trying to make and uh, trying to get into the U.S. market. It's going to be years before anybody is able to even come close to to have any sort of competition with the WWE because they are global and they continue to expand globally. If you have the drive and you have the determination, you can uh, be successful in the wrestling business. And that's the things that I took away from this interview with Shane McMahon and what I believe also. Other news, as we're going along here, we know that Brie Bella and Daniel Bryan had uh, welcomed their daughter, Birdie, Birdie Joe Danielson, into the world on May 9th. Shared some uh, photos, and they looked very happy. And uh, both of them ought to be great parents. Uh, MB- MTV announced that The Miz is going to be returning to their programming to host Invasion of Champions reunion on May 16th. That's great for The Miz. The Miz is, uh, which is next week. The yeah, Miz is, uh, he's a star waiting to happen. And everything he does is, uh, is, is great. We have other news here. Uh, uh, Chris Jericho's return to the WWE and his that he is scheduled the WWE release that he is scheduled for live events in Tokyo, Japan on June 30th and July 1st. Uh, he was uh, had a K Fabe attack by Kevin Owens, and they was able to write Jericho off TV. And Jericho now is touring with his band Fozzy in the release of their song Judas, which everyone should. Uh, should check out. It's a, it's a good piece of music. Uh, the WWE uh, teased a match, dream match between John Cena and Roman Reigns. Not a set date for this, but they did release a video package of hyping up a matchup. It's not a matter of, it's just a matter of when this match will take place. Uh, Triple H uh, spoke to. Uh, Justin Brazo on the Sports Illustrated Extra Mustard website, and he commented a little bit about the uh, criticism that they are getting, uh, some of the they are getting from uh, from uh, some of the uh, fans and from some of the critics of the WWE Performance Center that is too producing too robotic producing uh, wrestlers that have uh, no individuality. And uh, he said, uh, quote, that it's a misconception and is always the same and it's absolutely wrong. We're looking to make our talent as diverse as possible. Uh, people always say everyone is wearing the same thing and training the same way, yet they're not training Yet they're not training the same way. We group, we are grouping people together to work and building certain skills. The core of what we do is the same, yes, but you have to learn the same found, basically the same foundational techniques. Um, then they break off people and to the different trainers. Uh, he goes on and he says that the WWE performance. Trainers have Matt Bloom, Steve Carino, Norman Smiley, Terry Taylor, Robbie Brookside, Adam Pierce, and Scotty Scott Taylor, Scotty Too Hotty, and Sarah Amato. And breaks it down like, you know, Norman Smiley is the best coach for their beginning uh, trainees, and that's what he's best uh, suited with. And that is what, the, you know, so they're having the coaches to connect to the right people and put the talent in the, you know, in on the pathway to succeed. And uh, I believe that that is true, that that um, that that this is just that they're still getting the grasp on this. That even though they've been doing it for a few years now, the WWE, that it is um, still a process that they're learning, and the WWE is attempting to 
do the best that they can to train people and give them the opportunities. At times it does seem that people are too robotic, that there is no personality there, especially in their promos. If everything is scripted, there should be more freedom, I think, a little bit in the W and especially in NXT. But maybe they try that on the house shows. Maybe they try that. They do try that in the um, in the promo section to where they have a little bit more freedom and then they come up with something that will work with the writers. We'll see it get to the point to where that, you know, we get what, what we all want is that, you know, wrestlers back during the day that they had, I think we'll get to that point to where that the WWE will eventually give more their, their stars a little bit more, a little bit more freedom. And uh, but we have to appreciate the uh, the process what the WWE does with their performance center and the products that they have. Uh, given us and we have to remember that NXT is what it is but it's gone from just a little developmental project to doing over 200 live events and a year to four pay-per-views per year it said that his goal Triple H's goal is to make uh, NXT must see television so that you have to have the network. Uh, his goal is to make 205 Live the place to where to see the best high flying talent. And I can understand the WWE to a degree that they want to limit some of the more risky things that that the high that uh, the cruiserweights do, but you still have to let the cruiserweights do what they do the best. But still, some of the risk needs to be eliminated, and I think that that's what that they are attempting to do in the WWE. There's some spots, like they do in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and some to some extent what they do in um, Impact Wrestling that are a little bit too risky for the talent. I mean, you can do a shooting star press off the top rope, you know, out or and you can do a diving suicide dive out, but you know, if you miss, if the person doesn't catch you and you miss and you get injured, then what good is that? Um your number one goal is to protect yourself. Your second goal is to protect your the person that's in the ring with you. And that should be the first thing that uh, that you have in mind. Jinder Mahal recently made some uh, comments about uh, his uh, push that he has in the WWE. He said that he was very proud in representing India in the WWE. He said the Indian fans are passionate about their product and they're passionate about the WWE and it makes him proud to be representing all of them such a big skill and he hopes that he can become the WWE champion make all of India proud uh, he said I just want to thank the Indian fans supporting me and being very passionate about the product uh, his feelings about being the number one contender he um, had feeling uh, he thought that it was great with every thing in perspective you know I'm one win away from becoming the WWE champion. He's going to be more aggressive. He's going to train harder now. And his that is his goal to be the WWE champion. Don't know what the plans are for that. Black backlash. We'll just have to wait and see. He goes on. And he says Ginger's re- reveals his secret behind the transformation over the last few months and how he stays in peak shape. Uh, he said the secret is consistently I literally haven't had a cheat meal in three or four months I haven't eaten anything that I shouldn't have had even now on tour I have my cooling bag with me and I carry five meals with me so that I eat every two hours I eat 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrates 30 to 40 grams of proteins every meal then there's this 
cardio six days a week, the weight training six days a week. I've also become straight edge, and he does a lot of the uh, so a lot of the Olympic compound movements is what he says. Then there's the squats, the push-ups, other exercises overall from diet exercise. I see good results, and I'm going to get in better shape because not only do I look better, he said he feels better. I feel better on the inside in terms of the stamina and endurance, which is important from coming WWE championships and having long matches every night. My, you know, everyone knows my thoughts and my feelings on uh, Jinder Mahal. Um, there's been re and there's reports out there of people like um, he needs to get better in the ring, and that's what it comes down to is that he hasn't. I don't think that. Even though he's been around the WWE for a while, he's been wrestling for a while, still do not see much progression as far as entering uh, entering talent, and and I don't see a progression. There shouldn't have been a progression of him going not simply from an enhancement talent to being a contender for the WWE Championship. There should have been a a process there in what uh, he did and you know moving up the card building and building Jinder Mahal into something instead of just automatically putting him into into the spot um, but we'll see how things turn out uh, I hope that it's just not a one-shot thing for Jinder Mahal he is great on the promos uh, he's not his laxing, but he lacks in his entering ability. Uh, recently, Alexa Bliss was interviewed by most recent Talk Is Jericho podcast, and he interviewed her on separate different things. And we'll go over some of these things. First, he asked her how that she likes being a heel. She said that she loves being a heel; that it is a lot of fun. Uh, I like when I first found, quoting first, uh, like when I first found out I was going to be a heel, I had a really bad anxiety because the character I portray before was very bubbly, very, uh, was more of a princess type character and completely not relatable what, uh, whatsoever. So when they tell me I was going to be a heel, I had very bad anxiety because I don't know how to be mean and make someone hate me. So I had, so she had anxiety over it, and we would do heat drills inside the performance center, and I would just stop and start crying. In heat drills, you practice being mean to somebody, and you grab your opponent and put some heat on them, and say something mean, and just keep going. It's a really cool drill, but I would just have a really bad anxiety. But once you got used to it, it just became more and more fun. Again, this is, and it also this lets us see exactly what they do in the performance performance center. Uh, then Jericho asked her about her transition into the developmental system of the WWE. He says it's like going from high school to college for sure. It was really cool because it was the kind of a moment when you realize what all your hard work over the years went into development and just having a larger crowd that was amazing adapting to the travel and the people uh, I loved and she loved the girls and on Smackdown and they were also welcoming and I wouldn't be where I am without having that or that experience she said on Smackdown that she grew up that she was a wrestling fan growing up watching the Attitude Era she wasn't allowed to watch uh, <laughs> Raw, uh, wasn't allowed to watch wrestling during the Attitude Era, but she was a fan of the Hardys and Lita. And uh, she goes on and talks about that. And it was a good interview. It lets us again, uh, this theme of this this uh, new session here of what we have here this today is seemed like the theme of really inside of how it goes on into training. And... Um, and the do WWE process. Uh, also in the news, Brock Lesnar is advertised for upcoming Raw tapings. Um, 
Brock Lesnar Universal Champion is now being advertised for June 26th and July 3rd episodes of WWE Raw. You know, this is ridiculous. I'll say this. I know that Brock Lesnar is a part-time, and as I have said and stated in the past, the WWE, the Universal Championship does not need to be defended at every pay-per-view, but the WWE the WWE Universal Champion needs a presence on Raw. We need to know that the championship is there. And we're going to have to wait till June 26th and July 3rd before we see Brock Lesnar on TV. Seriously. <laughs> I cannot believe this. That, that we're going to have to wait this long. Um... It is, you think, he won the title in April, and his next appearance is in July, June the 26th. Maybe, I don't know if we're going to have any surprise appearances, to, you know, that he may just appear and be at Extreme Rules or something of that nature, but this is, you know, it's a little, it's a little bit ridiculous, I mean... You know, the old adage, how can you miss me unless I'm gone? But, you know, you're the champion. You need the presence. I remember back during the day, you know, when they had less pay-per-views, back during Hulk Hogan's run, when Hulkamania was running wild, Hulk, Hulk Hogan didn't defend the title all the time. He defended the title a lot at house shows and defended, and defended the title on we had Saturday night's main event which I love the concept of Saturday Night Main Event. That's before they had, they had every week of Raw. Uh, every week of Raw. You know, but still, even if it was just, you know, a pay-per-view, Hogan was involved in a tag match. He was involved in something. The WWE Champion was... His presence was there because he was the champion. He was off. He was on TV. He was the face of the company, and you need that as a champion. You need the guy to be there to show up. You're paying him all of this money. So, well, he just has. He's part time. He has. His, you know, you're paying him all of this money. He needs to be there to let you know. Hey, look, I'm the champion. I am the universal champion. And to me, it's kind of lame. Uh, that's my two cents on that. The WWE also announced this week with a new TV deal in Turkey. Again, the WWE is continuing to expand in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, May th uh, that um, that they will be starting their programming on Saturday nights of uh, Raw and SmackDown on S Sports in Turkey, which is good. I mean, get the W get the WWE product out there more. You know, the WWE is really doing some things to make to to expand globally, which is great for all of us. Uh, there's news uh, from Dave Meltzer, uh, Charlotte Flair, and her supposed baby face run that the wrestler observer radio reported and that the WWE is reconsidering Charlotte Flair's baby face turn which I agree with as it is noted backstage segment last week this Smackdown Live which saw Charlotte acting a bit more of a heel towards Naomi and Be Becky Lynch as maybe a tease once uh, again, that she may turn heel. Meltzer speculated that this might lead to an eventual Naomi versus Charlotte feud, and Charlotte taking the feud role. Um, but as of right now, Charlotte is still uh, babyface, which I believe that Charlotte is a natural heel. Uh, she's a damn good heel. Uh, some people call her robotic, but I feel that, uh, that, you know, maybe she does need to work on her promos just a bit, but she is good in the ring, and, uh, before it's all said and done, I feel that Charlotte Flair 
will be the greatest woman women's wrestler of all time. So hopefully the WWE will turn her heel, uh, just as her father. Charlotte works better as a heel. She knows how to get heat. She knows how, even though even though she can still be the face of the company, um, of the SmackDown Women's Division, by being by being the uh, by being a heel. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with uh, Natalia. I think that maybe they need to open up the door and just give Natalia just a little bit of the spotlight. I think that. That would be good, and then turn Charlotte heel. But this babyface idea with Charlotte Flair, I don't feel is a good, um, good thing. Uh, Jay Lethal comments: um, Ring of Honor former Ring of Honor champion, Ring of Honor uh, star comments on coming um, up as he did in the business and why he hasn't worked for the WWE. He says it's funny when I got into the wrestling business all I wanted to do was wrestle for the WWE and that was a major goal for everyone from my generation. Not saying that that's something that I would not do but along the way I sort of reprioritized things. Uh, with that said if I never worked for the WWE I wouldn't be too upset. I would wouldn't feel that that my career wasn't complete. I think that I've made it, and that he's a, and that that's something that a lot of wrestlers struggle with. Uh, Jay Lethal is amazing. I remember when he was in under TNA, he had the the black machismo, did a little bit of the Ric Flair things, and they tried several gimmicks. I'm glad he went to Ring of Honor where he could be himself and carve out his own uh, own destiny there to be original and he's you know he's a uh, he's good uh, he's a good talent good hand in the ring and uh, I wish him the best and he's amazing to watch JBL in the news again for his comments and for bullying tendencies recently on the WWE Network this week the program bring it to the table uh, while the camera was off to commercial and come back to the table that was there with Rosenberg Corey Graves and JVL JVL was making some interesting comments first he said on bring it to the table one of the things he said was, he said in reference to Sami Zayn, uh, he said he would rather be captured by ISIS than to have dinner with Sami Zayn. Then the other comment that he had, that he would rather be waterboarded than sit down and talk wrestling with Sami Zayn. With the track record of JBL, these comments are irreprehensible. I'm not one of these that call for the firing of anyone in the World Wrestling Federation unless the actions by that person is so irreprehensible that such actions deem necessary. These accusations and these comments by JBL are very not PC. They are derogatory towards Muslims. They are derogatory towards Sami Zayn. And the treatment of Sami Zayn in this regard needs to be addressed. JBL should face punishment for these actions and for these comments. I do not know, I'm not going to say that JBL needs to be fired, but yes, he does need to be punished. Uh, the, the excuse that they give is JBL is playing a character, that he's a heel commentator, 
and he says heelish things. There's a difference between being a heelish commentator and there and saying some things um, that are hateful, mean, and that are in downright insensitive. What makes these comments even more serious is that Sami Zayn was raised in as a Muslim by two Syrian immigrants to Canada. He has been an outspoken proponent of Muslim right. You be the judge on what should be the punishment for JBL. I find these comments very, very unprofessional. In regards to being a heel commentator, there are three people that we need to look at. Bobby Heenan, Jerry Lawler, or Jesse Ventura. These three was the model heel commentators. To be honest, the best of these three was the fourth man, Dutch Mantell, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Dutch Mantell was as a heel commentator was a genius. He did it perfectly. Even with all of what heels are supposed to be, they're not supposed to cross the line between that which is real and that which is part of the act. JBL with these comments about ISIS and some he would rather be waterboarded than talk wrestling with Sami Zayn is horrible uncalled for comments you be the judge I believe the WWE needs to do something about this definitely there needs to be some type of punishment JBL does need to be taken off TV for a while um, and he needs to have some sensitivity training uh, in the regards to these comments. That is my thoughts on this topic. You make the call on this on this issue, and that's all I got to say. Uh, Kenny Omega uh, was interviewed by ESPN about another topics, uh, wrestling topics that revolving uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, first off was uh, his uh, match with uh, Okada, uh, and he gives an opinion. He said, quote, he said, if I'm going to give you a personal opinion, I would say that I personally think that it's too soon to revisit this match. I would have liked just to let it be that per that performance be and come back to it at a later date, but there's there's there comes a time in business when it's just as important to move the numbers and put asses in the seat as the saying goes and you have to come out with guns blazing. I knew eventually that there would be a second match regardless of how good or bad it was. I think there will be a third match. I still think that there's going to be a Omega Okada 4 but I've, but I've been called to duty sooner than I would have liked to have been and personally the situation I'm put in a situation where the match is still very fresh on everyone's mind. So that was Kenny Omega's opinion on that. I'm looking forward to Kenny Omega versus uh, Okada 2. I don't think, I don't know if it was too soon or not. I think that maybe they're setting up Kenny Omega to win the IWGP Championship so that Okada can take a break. I hope that that's the case. Okada needs a break. He's been battered and bruised over the last uh, few months with some of the grueling matches that he has had and he did not think that he needs uh, a rest. He goes on, Kenny Omega goes on about uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling um, and his role of leading New Japan's launch into the United States. He said that he really wanted to be an integral part of the New Japan brand in the United States and other countries for the matter of fact too I feel that I have a certain versatility that other wrestlers do not and I think that as all around wrestler as even even as an all around human being I am someone who could accept the responsibility and not drop the ball in a particular situation I am 
not afraid to fail. Being able to man the ship would be an incredible honor, and I feel that doing it, if I feel that with me doing it, it's not no fail situation. Whereas if someone else was entrusted responsibility of doing it, I don't know whether how it would go. But I have a very precise vision that I can't see failing, and I really want to be the guy to give all and to make this thing truly worldwide. He goes on and says on New Japan being a different product uh, that that New Japan is not mimicking anyone. That this is New Japan. It's an option aside from other wrestling brands around. I don't mean just the WWE but it's different than uh, TNA or Impact Wrestling. It's different than Ring of Honor. and It's a, its own thing and it's a its own distinct look and its own distinct style, which is true. And and that was the end of the quote. Uh, very good quotes from Kenny Omega. I don't know if it's too soon for the matchup with Hokata again. Uh, like I said, I look forward to that. Uh, I think wrestling fans want that. I think that, uh, like I said, Okada does need a break about New Japan Pro Wrestling coming into the United States. Don't know exactly what the plans are for New Japan Pro Wrestling regarding the United States uh, title match uh, or title tournament. I don't know if Kenny Omega is going to be involved in that. Um, if he's involved in the U.S. title match, I don't see him uh, winning the IWGP um, championship. Uh, or we we could see exactly what uh, is going to transpire at Dominion well that if I, I predict this that if that if uh, Kenny Omega loses Dominion that it is going to set up Kenny Omega to be the first IWGP United States champion which would be a good thing and I wouldn't complain about that that or give the IWGP title to Michael Engel which is another good guy that uh that is currently on break from New Japan Pro Wrestling, but he is a name. He is a he's a uh, heavily talented uh, individual, and uh, he would be a great first champion of the United States title, IWGP United States uh, Championship. Uh, Impact Wrestling viewership uh, was up this week. Uh, I just want to cover this. You know my thoughts, my feelings, of Impact Wrestling, but uh, they. Uh, was up and drew sixteenth uh, more cent viewership than uh, than they did la the last week. I attribute this to uh, the title match between Alberto El Patron and Magnus, the uh, Global Force uh, Wrestling Championship. Uh, there was a number one hundred and thirteenth on the top one hundred and fifty list of cable shows. Uh, it's good that their viewership is up. They still have a long ways to go. Um, nowhere near what Raw and SmackDown is. Um, overall, the product is, a, I suppose, decent. But it, the six Saturday ring, I, and there's just things about the promotion that I, I don't like. Um, for what they do and who they are, I suppose it's a place to watch wrestling on Thursday nights. What they're doing with the announcers is annoying. Uh, with the the back and forth between them, uh, they really need to end that, and that's my thoughts on Impact Wrestling. But their viewership is up, which is good um, for all the people that work there. On Eric Bischoff on his uh, Bish uh, on his uh, podcast Bischoff on Wrestling, uh, he discusses about the significance of Sinclair Broadcasting who, Broadcasting who carries who's who owns ring of honor and sinclair broadcasting is have several stations that's around the country very big company but recently they uh news broke uh this week that they um purchased uh wgn um and this is a good move and could be a good move if 
Sinclair wants to include Ring of Honor in this as a platform to be a viable as as what uh, Bischoff terms that Ring of Honor can be a viable sports property now because they have the platform of WGN and everybody you know knows that WGN is a you know a, a, a station that everybody is accustomed to and they do have a national uh, a following um, not that they're anything like what the TBS or the Turner uh, super stations um, are but WGN does give a platform to where that Ring of Honor could, if Sinclair did choose to do so, reach a greater audience. Uh, recently, Justin Labar wrote in one of his articles about Angle that's going to be pitched now for Roman Reigns that since Braun Strowman has been injured, what are Roman Reigns, what are the WWE plans for Roman Reigns? Um, he suggests that uh, that Extreme Rules, we're going to see Samoa Joe versus Seth Rollins, and that Samoa Joe is um, going to team with Triple H versus Seth Rollins versus uh, uh, have S Samoa Joe and Triple H versus Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns and this will be continuing this feud um, I do not know if this is going to, I, I don't really feel good about this um, this prediction here simply because when does Triple I don't think with all of what is on Triple H table right now I don't know if Triple H has the time <laughs> to be involved in a feud on Monday Night Raw. I may be wrong on this, but um, don't know where Samoa, don't know where what direction that Samoa Joe or Seth Rollins is going to be going into. Um, Seth Rollins could be one of uh, since um, Braun Strowman could be coming back around the time of when uh, Brock Lesnar is going to be uh, make, has his first title defense at Great Balls of Fire uh, in July. Uh, that that uh, it may be Strowman or it might be Seth Rollins to be Braun Brock Lesnar's first opponent. I don't really think that this is the direction that they're going to go. Um, I look for them to continue the feud with Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins. Unfortunately, they need to change this up a bit. It is a bit stagnant. And what we was talking about earlier, what Stone Cold was talking about in his podcast, it seems to be a lot of the same old um, recycled in-ring stuff of what Seth Rollins and Samoa Joe are doing. They need to change things up a bit and make it more interesting. I'm sure that we'll be having a gimmick match at Extreme Rules between these two. And like I said, I don't know. We'll be finding out here in the next few weeks if uh, Justin Labar was uh, correct or not. But I, I don't, I don't see Triple H returning. He's too busy in the executive role that he is in. As far as Roman Reigns, there's rumors and speculation out there that Roman Reigns is going to win the IC title uh, and that he will be in a feud with Bray Wyatt and The Miz. I feel that putting the IC championship on Roman Reigns is a good thing. It elevates the title People say that it's very, I've heard this and different podcasters going off on their rants, but if you look at this from the WWE's point of view, I feel that this elevates the IC title, it elevates The Miz being in a feud with Roman Reigns. Uh, I hope that The Miz would not just 
be completely buried by Roman Reigns. Um, he needs to play the little chicken shit heel that he so plays perfectly with Roman Reigns. Uh, the Miz, his promo work would be apps if they give him the freedom to do so would be superb with Roman Reigns. I think that it could bring out some emotion and some feelings with Roman Reigns. He's not going to be really playing um, the same type of role of struggling to survive like he was against Braun Strowman. It's going to be a role of playing a heel that's just annoying that 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 his annoying tactics overcome the the big strong man of Roman Reigns. And I think the Miz could do a lot better job if he uh than what uh Kevin Owens did. I think the Miz maybe have a little bit more freedom and leeway than what Kevin Owens did. Kevin Owens finally was able, at the end of his title run, was able to be the Kevin Owens that we all love uh, as a heel. And we love to hate, but the Miz definitely does have heel heat. He knows how to get heat. He knows how to uh, say the things and deliver the promos that generate heat. And it could be good for Roman Reigns. I'm not saying that it's going to be to the point where it's going to elevate Roman Reigns to be the star that that the WWE higher-ups want him to be in getting that baby face pop. But it could lead him on that road. The IC title, I think, would be elevated uh, with Roman Reigns as the New Japan Pro title is being elevated right now with Naito. And uh, I don't like the fact that maybe the obscene IC title like strapped behind, put, you know, uh, how Roman Reigns carried the U.S. Championship, just carried it over his back instead of displaying the title. Um... Maybe they'll hopefully they'll give it he'll give it a little bit a little bit better uh, treatment, but uh, I wouldn't even I would say that I would keep the IC title on Reigns until WrestleMania, and uh, when he faces uh, Brock Lesnar, which I do think that that's going to be the road. You say, well, it just you know it's wrong. You know, people want to hate. You know what? We need to accept the fact that Roman Reigns is going to be the featured star in the WWE that's who they want that's who they're going to fe- that's who they're going to feature and people were this way about John Cena years ago that that he was that he was forced down their throat and people still hate some people still hate Cena but um, you know we have to come to the point where we realize that you know, Roman, Roman Reigns isn't that terrible in the ring. You know, we, you know, boo him or cheer him. It's your choice, and that's your choice as fans. But you know, uh, but you know, don't get personal and realize that it's just a, just a character that's on the screen that's that's portrayed here. I think the LSC title would be elevated with. Roman Reigns, as I have stated before, and if this is the plans for for the uh, for the Intercontinental Championship and Roman Reigns, I have no issues with it. I would hope that they, like I said, would not just give just a short run with the IC title with Roman Reigns, but they would just keep it on, keep the IC title on him, let him go through opponents, even if they're babyface opponents. Let him just go through opponents till uh, WrestleMania. And that way you keep Roman Reigns away from Brock Lesnar and you set up that match for WrestleMania, which undoubtedly that the WWE wants to do. 
And that is the news and notes for uh, this uh, week in this second week of May. I want to point to everybody to go to uh, sportsillustrated.com and check out an article that um, uh, on uh, the Daily Mustard that was one of uh, the first um, uh, an interview, heart to heart interview with uh, Triple H or Paul Levick, and you know people can criticize different things about different individuals in wrestling but you have to admire the story of Paul Levick Triple H and what he uh, went through in his WWE career people say that he buried people and all this stuff like that they say that about Ric Flair, they say that about Hulk Hogan, they say these that about different things, but you have to admire the path of Paul Levick and how that that he overcome adversity and uh, and he became one of the uh, one of the best superstars of all time, and not only that how that now he transitioned into an executive role with uh, the WWE. Though, like I said, it didn't hurt that he married Stephanie McMahon at all. But it is, you have to admire the fact that, you know, the, what he has accomplished and his vision for the WWE. And it's probably going to be that this is going to be the vision that the WWE is going to go for in the future. And I recommend this article for uh, for anybody to read. Uh, also, on note uh, about this podcast, you know, there are many things that are going on for podcasters and people that are on YouTube about YouTube um, cutting commercials uh, and cutting monetization about different podcasters and they're going through that these are people's livelihoods that that are affected and things of this nature and and while I do feel for those people I want people to know exactly what my goal is here on the Wrestling Maniac podcast is that I want to present this podcast once a week where it reviews the new, the events that happen in wrestling. Wish that I had the time and to review all the independent shows and to get involved in that. But quite frankly, I don't. I spend quite a bit of time uh, gathering information and watching information, uh, watching wrestling. Um, this is pro wrestling is the direction that I want my career to go. I know that, you know, me personally at 42 years of age, that, that I'll never be a performer in the ring per se. But I would love to be a personality in wrestling. I want to present a podcast first that is professional, that people can listen to and get some different, maybe a different opinion on pro wrestling, and that it is not necessarily a continuous rant and of foul language and uh, that I will never lower myself to becoming a what I term a smut show that I do want to present a level of professionalism because that is just who I am that's how I have been raised I know that this is perhaps a big endeavor for me to uh, to take time out of my schedule, do this show, 
uh, but the more that I do this, the better that I will get. I know that with a southern accent that many times that, it, that uh, I stumble, I stutter a lot. I try to edit a lot of that out, but sometimes I don't. But the more and more you do something, the better that you will, the better you will get. I believe that I offer an insight into pro wrestling, that I see things that uh, from an intelligent and and I attempt from an objectional uh, point of view. I love pro wrestling. It is it is my passion. Um, I want to be in pro wrestling not simply to make money but simply because that it is the one thing that I do enjoy in life I have other things that I am involved in with music and that nature I do have a website uh, ultimateworldwrestling.com and I express my uh, my desire there that eventually I would like to start an independent promotion. I don't know exactly. I know that the promotion probably would never be on the scale of what the WWE is. And that right now it's just in the um, it's sort of in the idea phase. Uh, I, you know, I need people to help. I need people to help to train wrestlers I need the 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 finances to be able to be able to put together to to finance this uh, to finance my dream and there are many people that are out there and they are you know they continue, they're more of an infomercial than what they are a entertainment podcast and I never want to get to the point to where it seems like I am begging people for finances and I'll never do that because I have too much pride to do that if you see fit to support the show if you see fit to support my ideas if you see fit to support and be a part of this dream that that I want to to do in my life, then I would greatly appreciate uh, your support. Uh, the podcast, still working on trying to get it on uh, iTunes, which it it is a little bit of a, a little bit of a task trying to to understand exactly how to do that. If anybody wants to help with that, then I appreciate it. But um, I don't have the professional equipment that I need to produce a professional quality uh, podcast but I'll get there I'm satisfied with what I have right now I do have t-shirts that are for sale I am um, not on prowrestlingtees.com but at this moment um, I the company that I do do the t-shirts with it takes uh, 30 days from the time that the t-shirts goes up or however long the however long that I put the t-shirts up for sale and then it's two weeks after to to get your t-shirts which I don't like that it's such a long time for those uh, t-shirts to be shipped to customers but it is what it is it's the the method of how I have to raise funds and have some great designs. Um, so if you want to support this, if you want to support this show going forward, if you want to support this show, uh, you can either donate to the Patreon, or you can, um, or you can buy a T-shirt. There's some reasonably cheap T-shirts that are there. Uh, I appreciate everyone that what that that helps and that does support this show, does support my effort. I know that there are many wrestling podcasts out there. I know there's many wrestling guys that's out there, and they do outlandish things to draw attention to themselves. But I am what I am. I'm no nonsense 
direct. I give my thoughts. I give my feelings. If you like what I say, support me. If you don't, then don't. Um, but I would like some feedback. I would like for you to email me or for you to uh, follow me on Twitter. I do need Twitter followers. I do need to get my Twitter followers up over 5,000. need to get it, my Twitter followers close to 10,000 so that I can get on ProWrestlingTees.com. Um, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to do for the rest of my my life. Um, uh, I love wrestling. It is a great product. It is, I think that... I love wrestling because of the message of what it can, the inspiration of what it can give people to change their lives. It it goes wrestling goes it can it goes beyond what religion can do or politics can do, and we are surrounded in such a negative atmosphere that is that we have today. Whether, regardless of who we support, or regardless of what we believe, I believe that the positivity of pro wrestling can help us have an escapism to this, to this, to the to the garbage that's going on in this world. One of the characters I created is Guru, and if you look on my website, you look at the things that I try to, the positivity that I try to promote. Uh, with that character, I have several different characters that I have uh, that I have come up with that I say are part of the UWWF, um, and so these are my thoughts. These are my feelings. Is you know, regardless of if it's fifty cents, one dollar, or regardless of if it's even just a comment, I appreciate I appreciate uh, anything that that you're able to contribute. Uh, to this show and to my dream and this is my dream and I will my dreams will come true because I have faith that they will um, so I'm not going to give up hope uh, so you all have a blessed day I hope that you enjoyed the podcast and this is the Wrestling Maniac Podcast you can follow me on Real Guru Wrestle on Twitter, you can uh, go and you can check out my website, ultimateworldwrestling.com. Uh, and you can check out the shop and you can check out the message boards. Just like for people to uh, be involved. And, you know, whether it's positive feedback whether it's negative feedback you know I really don't really pay attention to people that are you know overly that really give derogatory comments I really just sort of ignore people like that uh, but if you have a constructive criticism I'm willing to take that and I hope that you enjoy the continue to enjoy the podcast and you have you know, continue to enjoy wrestling ready for Monday Night Raw and ready for things to get rocking have a blessed day and keep it real people this is Marvelous Mike and the Wrestling Maniac Podcast